Hi everyone, uh, today I'm trying to answer the question, how good are stop losses really? Are they actually a good tool for risk management? Now I'm not talking about the stop losses that you might use as part of a strategy, but purely the stop losses that you could use to manage your risk. In one of my recent talks I've actually said to the audience, well I don't really use stop losses, I don't think they're any good, and maybe I was a bit cocky in saying that. And it's true that I really don't use stop losses for risk management, I use other tools. But nevertheless, uh, when I said it, I realized uh, I haven't actually fully tested this whole thing. So that's what I'm going to do today and I hope you join me and you enjoy the video. Now to get started, um, I would typically use my uh, Colab Python notebooks here and I just import a few standard packages, as you can see, NumPy, uh, PyLab, or, uh, Matplotlib, YFinance, Pandas, and Daytime. Now, um, if you wanna uh, install YFinance, which is basically getting market data from Yahoo Finance, you have to run pip install YFinance to get it. Okay, so um, I've got the, uh, a few things here that I've already set up in my notebook, and I will talk about them later. But uh, what I want to do first is show you my methodology of what I'm going to do. Now, um, as you maybe know from my older videos, there's various ways to set up back tests. One is that we can just write a loop, and when we get an event, we basically trigger a buy or sell uh, event, and then um, we, we do this, and then we calculate the P&Ls. But what you probably also learned is that this is a very, very slow method uh, to do this. And the faster one is to run a vectorized backtest. Now, uh, in also one in, on my previous videos, I actually showed how to do this uh, for stop losses and profit takes for that matter. And you probably uh, also learned that this is not quite as simple. It's a bit more tricky. So uh, I don't wanna go into the details of how this is done again today. But what I've done is I uh, basically set up a loop back test here for a very simple trading strategy, the moving average crossover. Um, and you can see this here. And what I've then done is I have set up the same back test, in fact, uh, for uh, a vectorized uh, version of it. So as you can see in the loop back test, I've got my uh, signal generator here, my entry conditions. And then I've got some exit conditions. And here I've got a, a profit take condition as well and a stop condition. So I can trigger them if I want to. I don't have to, of course, I can set my stop losses and profit takes really wide and then uh, they are basically not triggered. And it just trades as if it was just a straightforward uh, moving average crossover strategy. It's pretty simple. Okay, so, um, here, this is uh, the code for the vectorized spec test, and if you want to know exactly how that works, please check out some of my earlier videos where I go through this in very close details. All right, so, so this is, uh, here you can see, it's quite a lot of uh, vector operations to be done in these vectorized spec tests, so it's kind of complicated. Nevertheless, what I've done here is I've basically ran a test uh, of a looped versus a vectorized spec test, and so I'm going to run this now. And um, so it takes a few seconds for the loopback test. And so you can see um, here, this is the uh, P and L curve. And you see that the outside blue one is the vectorized back test. The inside orange is the uh, loopback test. And they match perfectly. Now uh, the runtime of the ver uh, vectorized back test is 70 or 74 milliseconds and the one of the loop back test is 3.7 seconds. So it's about 50 times as long to do loop back test than a vectorized back test. And what, what that means, as you can see, is it's definitely uh, when you wanna do a large scale uh, test, back test, parameter, uh, parameterized back test, you definitely wanna go with vectorized because the difference of uh, 50 times means that you can run a back test, say in one minute or in one hour and or approximately. Um, and then that's that's definitely a huge uh, time saver. And so um, in my next bit, what I have done is following. I've basically got the vectorized back test here. 
Um, so I'm not going to continue with the loopback test, just use the vectorized one. And I have two versions. I have one where I use a stop loss, and I have one where I don't use a stop loss. And what I do is I run it through a wide range of different uh, parameter sets. And perhaps, uh, as you know, when you do a moving average crossover, you have two parameters, which is the two lookbacks. And when they cross over one way, you trade in one direction. When you cross over the other way, you trade in the other direction. Now, in our case here, we only trade one direction. So we just do this for a long only because it's just much simpler to do and much easier to understand the results. So we don't want to go too much into the details, but this is a, a long only vectorized moving average crossover backtests. So what that basically means is when the uh, uh, short window moving average is above the slow window moving average, we go long. If it's the other way, we stay out of the trades. So that's basically what it means. What I've also done here is I randomized um, my stop losses. So I basically just introduced uh, random parameters for my stop losses, obviously within certain bounds. And so um, uh, to do this, what I can do is here, I produce uh, some vectors. And in this case, you can see uh, we've got uh, two parameters here and I need to change this in order to get the right things. Um, also here, uh, because we're not only doing the moving average crossover, we'll be doing something else as well later on. So here now we've got the moving average crossover strategy. Uh, we've got our two uh, input parameters, which has our two lookback windows for our moving average crossover. And then here I say profit takes is just a vector times uh, 10,000. Just means uh, in in this first test, we leave out the profit takes. We simply introduce a stop loss and our stop loss is a random number uh, minus, a t uh, minus a random number. So stop losses are negative. We go, you know, we're losing something. And then I do uh, times uh, 0 0.5. So basically means our stop loss depth is between zero and minus 50%. Um, so that's just a, a random parameter. We can obviously change that. And of course, 50% is quite wide, but what we want to see is really a wide cross section, a wide statistical analysis of do back tests, uh, do, do stop losses actually work. Okay, and then um, here I stack those input parameters. And what I do then is I feed them into my uh, run single uh, function, which runs the back test basically. And these inputs here are my parameterized inputs. So I loop through these inputs. And what I've also done is I've got a, a list of uh, instruments that I want to trade. I show you in a moment what they are. And rather than just using all the instruments at any given time, what I'm doing here is I'm actually picking a random number of instruments out of the list of all the instruments we have. So what that means is we, we really keep uh, this whole thing quite statistical and flexible and broad and uh, we'll, we'll see what the results are. Now to start with, the instruments that I use, I show you in a moment here that I'm scrolling through, are just some big US uh, uh, or New York Stock Exchange traded instruments, IBM, Apple, Goldman, Google, the S&P 500, IWM, Tesla, uh, Meta, Facebook, Netflix, and Amazon, so we've got uh, IWM, which is a index, um, sorry, it's, it's it's an ETF, and SPY obviously is an ETF as well. But for our analysis, it doesn't actually matter that much. What we really want to see is, statistically, do stop losses give us advantages over not using them? Okay, so let's trade those first, and then um, we'll 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 look into detail a little bit more. Okay, so. Um, what I've set up here is basically a number of these tests. So I introduce a whole lot of random numbers. Let's just say we run a thousand of them and uh, we have stops, but no profit takes. And so let's just start running this. And it takes a little time to run. So um, as you can see, it's pretty fast. I mean, 
When you think about it, uh, we run in this case uh, 2,000 backtests, uh, uh, 1,000 vector or 1,000 with stop losses, 1,000 without stop losses, and we also run them uh, over quite a long range of or quite a long time, and we have up to uh, 10 or 12 instruments uh, in here uh, that we can run at the maximum. So it's actually quite a significant number of backtests, and as you can see, it's running. Um, pretty fast and we just wait a few more seconds and then we get the results. So I'm not explaining the code here too much in detail today because that's not what the focus is on. The focus really is on what is actually happening with the stop losses. So uh, the backtest has finished and we can see here these are the results. So the reds are our, our backtests with stop losses and the greens are our back tests without stop losses. You can see the reds are somewhat lower than the greens, but it doesn't really tell us anything about uh, risk management. Now, if we want to know about uh, risk management, uh, we don't necessarily want to look at the P&L curves or at the profits that we make, but rather at the risk adjusted returns. And the risk adjusted return is also called uh, the sharp ratio or it's, it's sharp ratio is a, is a metric uh, in this case, uh, we use the Sharpe ratio without using the risk-free rate because we're just comparing uh, different strategies and the different risk-adjusted returns of these strategies. So when you look up here, what I have actually done is for each of those, um, for each of those uh, back tests in this single run, I calculated uh, the Sharpe ratio. So you can see this here, S stop and S uncon means unconstrained. So the sharp ratio with stop loss, the sharp ratio without stop loss. Okay. And now what we want to do is we want to look at the statistics. Okay. So I run this and you can see this here. So this is really interesting. So the orange uh, statistic is basically a histogram of the sharp ratios of what we just seen. Uh, without the stop loss, and the blue one is the histogram of the sharp ratios uh, with the stop loss. And you can also see the average sharp ratios. And this is really interesting. Without the stop loss, our average sharp ratio is 0 0.82, but without the stop loss, it's only 0 0.63. So it's significantly lower. And you can see here this uh, in blue, you know, we've got a significant, we've got this double. Uh, double peak here, this, this, this bimodal distribution almost, and you can see there's quite a lot in the negative range, whereas most of our back tests uh, for the unconstrained uh, strategy are actually in the positive range, uh, no matter what the parameter sets are, which is sort of a typical behavior. Uh, moving average crossover is not necessarily an amazing strategy, but it, you know, in, in, in a in the market as the one we just look, it gives us a lot of positive results because uh, make no mistake, uh, until uh, the last year or so, we have been in a bear market for a long time. Uh, sorry, in a bull market, of course, for a long time. So it should give us some positive results. Now, this obviously uh, is a little bit of a, uh, a look ahead bias there because uh, what we did is we really just picked uh, the top uh, stocks so we know they have been in a bull market and we know that you know they gave us positive results but this is not really the point the point is well does a uh, stop loss actually really help us with our risk management and what we can see here is effectively that um, when we use stop losses uh, and we do this in a completely statistical randomized fashion we get a a sharp ratio which is about 25% less uh, than the uh, sharp ratio if we don't use a stop loss. And I think this is a really interesting, significant result. Now, um, that's obviously not enough. Let's say, uh, what is our probability uh, when we trade with a stop loss uh, versus when we trade without a stop loss that, that our sharp ratio will be higher uh, with a stop loss than without a stop loss. And so I'm running this little bit of code here, basically comparing the stop loss and without stop loss column. And I see in which of these, which of the, the rows uh, we've got a higher uh, sharp ratio 
with the stop loss than without the stop loss. And what you can see here is only in 10% or sorry, 18% of the cases we're actually uh, getting a better sharp ratio uh, when we trade with a stop loss than without a stop loss. So what it tells us is a stop loss really in this case, in this particular case, is not that great to manage our risk. In fact, there's only a one in a five chance or less than one in a five chance that when we use a stop loss, we're actually managing our risk better uh, than we do when we don't use it. All right, so just for completeness, it uh, would be nice to actually know also um, what are the uh, correlations, uh, or what is the correlation between, you know, the improvement uh, in, in the stop loss. And so, so what I've done is basically uh, I, I uh, plotted the sharp uh, without a stop uh, versus the sharp with stop. And this is also quite interesting. So here we've got our sharps uh, without a uh, stop. And so this is this is our uh, correlation. So what it means is that it actually shift. It it actually uh, so, so as we go from from lower sharps to higher sharps, we actually get more of an improvement um, in the stop loss uh, in the in the sharp ratios as the sharp ratio of our underlying strategy increases. So when the sharp ratio of our underlying strategy gets higher our stop loss can actually help us a little bit more than when it is lower. However, overall, um, the, uh, just using uh, randomized stop losses, this uh, curve here is shifted uh, down negatively when we use a stop loss by uh, 0 0.5 points. So that's, that's huge. And so, so what that means, as soon as we use a stop loss, we're really lowering um, our risk management uh, capabilities quite significantly. Um, so here I've done this, I basically looked at the correlation between the sharp ratio and the difference between the two sharp ratios. And again, you know, it, this is what we've seen here. Uh, when, um, as, as our underlying sharp ratio increases, the difference overall between the, um, the sharp ratio of the stop loss and the sharp ratio of the um, of the uh, strategy without a stop loss actually decreases. Uh, that that sort of confirms what we've seen here in this curve when we look at this uh, slope of one point six three. And again, you know, it's not a obviously it's not not a great correlation here, but it's just a, a little spurious uh, one that we see. Now, uh, finally, uh, for 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 this particular part, I also would like to look at the uh, PNL. So I done the same histogram plot for the PNL, and I just just look at the final PNL here. And as you can see, on average, uh, uh, the final PNL uh, without stop losses is is, is close to four hundred percent, whereas the final PNL uh, with stop losses is only two hundred fifty three percent. And for this up. Actually, I should rerun this again um, just to be sure. In fact, uh, uh, these were the old numbers. Uh, the numbers have changed a little bit. You can see it's actually 240% with stop loss and 390% without stop loss. So by the way, these are not compounded um, P&Ls. These are un uncompounded P&Ls. So I'm summing up uh, the percentage uh, P&Ls uh, for each day uh, of profit. Um, Oftentimes, uh, when we plot uncompounded uh, P&Ls and backtests, they can give us quite strange values, especially when the backtest is really good. We get these exponential increases, which are often not quite realistic. So I would rather not use them. And finally, we see what's the probability of uh, the backtest or of our P&L uh, with stop loss being higher than the P&L without stop loss. And as you can see here, it's actually pretty low. It's it's just about 9%. So it's quite low probability that we make more profit using a stop loss than without. So this tells us, well, actually, uh, the risk management capabilities for our stop loss for this particular case aren't that great. All right, well, we acknowledge that, but then you can say, well, you know, you picked a very specific data set and a specific strategy. Okay, that's that's a really fair point, and maybe uh, things change quite significantly 
when we use a different data set. Now, and now we're tied here a little bit to equities also because why finance only allows us to do US stuff. So what I have done is I've actually taken a, a big set of uh, 12 sector ETFs um, and I'll show you what I've done here. Um, in this case, I use uh, sector ETFs from different sectors. So what I've done here is I basically build these sectors, XLB, XLC, XL, Y, XLP, they're all the, all the ETFs for the different sectors, healthcare, uh, technology, uh, consumer goods, and so on, uh, real estate, RE here. And so what I can do is I can just download them. And if we look at, if we look at this uh, data frame, uh, you can see up here in the, in, at the top, We've got XLB, XLC, XLF, and all these all these different sector ETFs. I don't want to get too close into what they all are. They're basically covering pretty much all the sectors in the US market. All right, and then I'm going through the same exercise again. I'm running uh, a thousand back tests. And in fact, uh, you can do this with a lot more back tests. I skipped the, uh, I skip the test here again because we established that that works all right, so we don't need to do this again. Um, so I'm just going uh, through my parameter uh, sweep here. So I'm sweeping through the uh, lookback windows. I'm sweeping through the different uh, stops, and then I'll see how this goes. So again, this takes a little time, usually a little more than a minute. So we have to wait, but you can see again it's running fairly fast. And remember, when we build our portfolios, we build the portfolio size random. So our minimum number of ETFs that we have in our portfolio is two, and the maximum number is all the ETFs. And then we have random stop losses and we have random look back windows again. So it's, it's a very broad uh, statistical sweep. And ideally, uh, we should run it over a lot more than a thousand back tests. However, I have already done this. I have run it over uh, 10,000 back tests and even 50,000 back tests, and the results do not change very much at all. So uh, I decided to only run a thousand. And so while this is running, I can actually present this uh, to you here in my video. All right, and we're almost finished. So it just needs to uh, plot the plots uh, for the um, results. And as you can see here, again, in green, uh, this is the uh, one without the stop losses, the unconstrained, and you can see that the uh, sector ETFs uh, already show a bit less uh, uh, positive performance because we know uh, they are the different sectors. So, so it's not a uh, selection of the best performing uh, assets like in the S&P 500, but it's actually much more of a, a cross-section of the US market uh, than before. Uh, but again, you can see that, that in red here, the stop losses, they don't necessarily uh, perform as good in terms of P&L eventually. But the question is uh, not so much, uh, does it give us a better P&L, but does it give us a better risk management? And so let's just draw the histograms again. And interesting here, we see again this bimodal distribution, which is fascinating, but uh, this is uh, also really interesting. So our average uh, sharp ratio without stop loss is 0 0.38, and with stop loss is only 0 0.1. So it's almost four times bigger. So, so, so our average stop loss, uh, uh, our average sharp ratio with stop loss is extremely bad. Um, it's It's almost, it's almost zero, so so we're not doing very well at all uh, with the stop losses, but um, without the stop losses, at least you know zero point three eight. It's not a great strategy, obviously, but it's not too bad. Like it's at least uh, at least significantly uh, better than when we use stop losses in this case. Um, so let's just see what the probability is of getting a higher sharp ratio with stop losses. And the probability is even lower uh, than before, it's only 0 0.41. Now remember when we uh, did the correlation, uh, the scatter plot between them, uh, you remember that the higher stop losses, uh, sorry, the higher sharp ratios of the underlying strategy 
actually did better when we introduced stop losses than the lower sharp ratio strategies. Now here we've obviously got a lot more lower sharp ratio strategies than before. So that's actually what we would expect. Again, it's quite consistent uh, with what we've seen before. Now I haven't done this myself, so I'm still surprised by it as well. And so let's see what we get here. And again, um, same uh, is quite consistent with what we see previously. This 1.699 uh, uh, is our slope and our sharp ratio or the, the drop in the levels uh, is uh, 0 0.54, so it's 54% uh, dropping uh, when we use a stop loss. But um, the slope is 1.6, so actually as we increase the sharp ratio uh, here of, uh, of the unconstrained strategy, then uh, our stop losses uh, fare a little bit better, which is, which is at least something. Now uh, we can see this again with the difference and let's see what we get there. And again, we get the negative slope, meaning as our sharp ratio increases, the difference between the two sharp ratios uh, actually decreases uh, a bit. So that means, you know, stop losses basically mean, uh, are more helpful or they could be more helpful as we have strategies with higher sharp ratios. That's an interesting result. and. I haven't seen this before uh, myself, so I think this is worth at least noting. Now, um, let's do this uh, for the uh, average uh, returns. And you can see here again is a, a bimodal uh, uh, return behavior for our stop loss strategy. And the average uh, final return is 50% whereas without a stop loss, it's 174%. Um, and you can see the peak is, is actually, this is the second peak in the bimodal distribution is actually in the negative. And the first peak here for the stop loss strategy is much, much lower than uh, for the unconstrained strategy. So that's a pretty fascinating result. And again here, if we use a stop loss strategy, we only have a 4% probability of the strategy with the stop loss being better than the strategy without the stop loss. Wow. Fascinating stuff, isn't it? I'm actually surprised about this myself because I often said, oh, don't use stop losses. They're not actually that helpful um, for managing risk. But uh, I think this confirms it uh, pretty well. Now you could say, well, Tom, this is just um, this is just one strategy and you know there may be other strategies well actually I have uh, also before I did this video uh, tested a few other strategies and it pretty much behaves the same across the board I mean there, there may be strategies uh, that really do well with a stop loss and in fact in some strategies such as typical commodity trend following strategy the stop loss is really a part of the strategy so I'm not saying uh, don't categorically use a stop loss. If the, pro if the stop loss is part of your strategy, by all means, please use it. But if you use a stop loss purely for risk management, you should really think about it. And you should really perhaps look into uh, using something else instead. And um, I have quite a few videos uh, where I talk about better ways of risk management. I've also got uh, a few courses. <clears throat> Some of them are on Podia and you can find the link below where I explicitly talk about how you can manage risk in a better way. I've also got an interesting course on Quantra that talks about micro alphas and I go into much, much more detail of the things that I've discussed here. Um, how you set up, uh, for example, vectorized strategies and how you uh, mine uh, alphas and combine them uh, to get better strategies. So if you are interested, check out uh, my Quantra uh, courses as well. I put a link below. Okay, so um, now let's let's just uh, let's just run another strategy uh, just just to confirm what we've seen. And so, what I've prepared here is a really really basic uh, strategy. Uh, you know, I'm a busy guy. I uh, also uh, do a lot of work as a quantitative analyst and researcher. So 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 I don't have time uh, to prepare these videos for too long. So 
what I've done is I prepared a really, really straightforward Bollinger Band strategy. And the strategy is basically, if we are above the Bollinger Band, uh, we are, or if we are above, you know, the, the upper Bollinger Band, we go long, we stay in a long trade. If we go below the Bollinger Band uh, on the upper side, we exit. Uh, and that's, that's really uh, pretty straightforward stuff. Now, um, let's try this again uh, first with our uh, top US stocks here. And then we have to change a few of the parameters uh, in order to get this correct. So I basically uh, comment out my moving average crossover and I go into my Bollinger Band strategy and I have to run this just to be sure. And then I also have to change uh, something here. Uh, basically, oops, basically have to change uh, one of the uh, parameters. Um, so what I'm doing here is basically I'm changing the width of the Bollinger Band. So um, it basically goes from zero to four. So sometimes uh, you, you probably know the Bollinger Band is effectively the difference uh, between your moving average over a certain period and then uh, a few standard deviations above uh, uh, above your moving average, standard deviations in terms of price. Uh, this is your upper Bollinger Band, and if my strategy is above that Bollinger Band, um, we're basically uh, in a long trade. Otherwise, we're not in a trade at all. So that's that's effectively it. And then um, again, I'm you know. I'm, all I have to change is this and then I can run I can run this uh, as it is and again it will take probably about a minute or so to run and uh, again it's it's pretty fast now this is not a sophisticated strategy but it doesn't actually really matter you can try this with many many strategies more or less sophisticated ones uh, and then introduce or leave out the stop loss and most likely you will see very similar results because when we run these uh, types of strategies, that you know they they produce quite consistent uh, results if you keep the stop loss or if you take it away. And I've seen this across the board, so it doesn't mean um, um, you know just because you use that one special strategy, it, it will actually be that much different. And you know we're not saying it doesn't work for specific cases here. But what we're really saying is, what is the probil probability of the stop loss actually working properly? And that's, that's what we're looking at.